Welcome to this Word from the Word, a Bible study brought to you by the folks here at the Madariaville Assembly of God. The series we're presently in is entitled Important Foundations for Faith. Uh, we've been looking at Bible truths, truths that are held by Bible-believing Christians. Some of these truths I would call non-negotiable. They're not open to debate. Uh, there are doctrines, beliefs held by all true believers. Let's just take a quick review of where we've been thus far. If you're just now joining us and interested in the rest of the series, you can go back and find all of these on our YouTube channel. How we began with the Word of God. Thank God He's given us an inspired, infallible, and authoritative Word of God, the Bible. Now, without that authoritative standard, we have no ground at all upon which to discuss any other doctrine. Then we spoke about the one true God, all-knowing, all-powerful, eternal God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We continued with the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, the Son of God. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He lived a sinless life. He performed mighty miracles. He died in our place on the cross. He rose bodily from the grave. He ascended to heaven. He's coming again. From there, we looked at what the Bible says about the fall of man and the salvation of man. We talked about such things as how are we saved? Can we know that we're saved? And of course, if you're with us, you know that we can definitely know that we have been born again. Then last week, we began looking at the ordinances of the Lord's church. Uh, ordinance literally means something that has been ordained. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are those ordinances. As obedient servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will want to be baptized in water, and we will want to receive the Lord's Supper on a regular basis. And if you'd like to, like I said earlier, if you'd like to uh, go to the previous study, you can find the other ordinance, the, the one about water baptism last week. But tonight it's the Lord's Supper we're studying, and it's, we'll see. Now, the Lord's Supper is a time when the body of Christ comes together. But if you're a believer and not able to meet together with us here at the church, we'll be giving instructions a, a little bit later on on receiving the Lord's Supper there in your homes. So if you'd like to participate, if you'd like to receive the Lord's Supper at the end of this study, you can get some things ready now. Pause the video. Uh, you'll need some unleavened bread. Crackers will do. You'll also need what the Bible calls the fruit of the vine. Grape juice is fine. These are what we would call the elements that represent the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not my planning, but it's the perfect planning of the Holy Spirit that brought this particular study at this particular time. This is Holy Week. The week we remember our Lord's death and resurrection, and I love the way he works out the plan, dovetailing everything together. Praise God forever. Well, to start with, as we talk about the Last Supper, we realize that it had its beginnings in the Passover, particularly Jesus' last Passover with his disciples. We call it the Last Supper. Of course, we read about that in the Gospels. And I'm going to have you turn with me to Matthew 26. So we read about that last supper that Jesus had with his disciples. And we, we recognize this was a Passover celebration. Matthew 26, 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Now, like I said, this was a Passover. Passover, if you will remember, was when the Jews celebrated their miraculous deliverance from Egypt. Uh, the final judgment on the Egyptians, you know, the firstborn in every household dying. 
uh, through a great judgment. But God delivered the Israelites. Uh, they were to take the blood of a perfect, spotless Passover lamb and apply the blood to the doorposts of their homes. Then when the death angel came through the land and brought judgment on the homes of the Egyptians, those homes with the blood would be passed over. And thus we have the English word Passover. God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And every generation after the Jews have celebrated that. Now, Jesus forever changed the emphasis for us. When we take that bread and cup today, we don't kill a Passover lamb. We realize that Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb, that he died for us. Uh, just one scripture of many that we could look to, but 1 Corinthians 5, 7 Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that's yeast, or something that causes the bread to rise, that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Uh, in the book of Revelation, we see him called the Lamb of God. Verse 8, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, Passover, part of the preparation was to remove anything in the house that had leaven in it. Uh, leaven, as we see in the New Testament, is a type, uh, symbolically speaks of sin. Uh, we realize one reason for that maybe is it has the ability to spread and permeate. So today, in examining ourselves, before we take the Lord's Supper, we repent and we turn from that leaven, that sin, that is in our lives, and that's what we just read about, purging out that old leaven. Uh, just as the Jews were to offer a perfect lamb at Passover, Jesus is now our perfect lamb. Very important that he lived a sinless life. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin, the Bible says. The matzah, the unleavened bread, and the cup of Passover, you know, the Seder, ceremony that the Jews had would forever for us have a new meaning. That bread now speaks to us of the body of Christ and the cup speaks of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ now and forever as we receive the Lord's Supper. Now let's look at some of the important truths about the Lord's Supper. Well, we know the Lord's Supper is a command that has been given to us. One of the frequent scriptures that we read when receiving the Lord's Supper is from 1 Corinthians 11:23. Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church. He says, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. Now the teaching that Paul gives us on the Lord's Supper here was not something that he just dreamed up, thought up himself. He said it was something that he had received from the Lord and delivered it unto us. This is... Uh, not a suggestion, this is a command given uh, from the Lord himself. And that alone should be enough. We want to obey him, remembering the Lord's death until he comes by receiving the Lord's Supper. And may God help us to be obedient in that area. When it comes to obedience, so many have the idea they want to have God bless them and then they'll be obedient. However, we obey first and then we receive the blessing. Such a great blessing in obediently receiving the Lord's Supper as commanded, and we should do so on a regular basis. We also receive the Lord's Supper. We realize it is the example of the early church, of the church in the book of Acts. If you turn to Acts chapter 2, it describes what church life was like after the day of Pentecost. What important things did they emphasize? And we see some of that in Acts 2.42. If you'd like to turn over there in your Bibles. It says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship 
and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's the teaching of the apostles, those things taught by the apostles of the Lord. And of course, they would be teaching according to the word of God. I remember the word is our source of authority and what we teach as it was then. They continued steadfastly in fellowship. The word is koinonia, that sweet relationship between those who have that most wonderful thing of all in common, the Lord Jesus Christ. They also knew the importance of keeping the cross in the center of their lives. One of the reasons that we remember uh, to, when we receive the, the Lord's Supper, we remember the cross. We remember that it took the death of Christ. It took the cross to save us. It's so easy for us to fall into some kind of religious system or ritualism, some kind of works mentality, and forget about what it costs to redeem us. It would appear that the Lord's Supper was taken on a very regular basis in the early church. In fact, Acts 27 tells us that they met on the Lord's Day on Sunday for the breaking of bread and to receive the Lord's Supper together. Acts 27, upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. And that's a very specific phrase, not talking about just a fellowship meal, but it's talking about the Lord's Supper, I believe, more particularly so they, they met together on the first day of the week to break bread. Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and he continued his speech until midnight. A long sermon. So following their example, we should take the Lord's Supper on a regular basis. In doing so, we remember his death until he comes. We remember the cross. You know, we know that history has both an A.D. and a B.C., B.C. before Christ, A.D. in the year of our Lord. And we have the same in our lives. We have a before and after. Today we can sing at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. Or the old hymn that says, lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. We don't want to ever forget the price that was paid. That's what taking this bread and cup is all about. When we receive the Lord's Supper, we remember that we're one in Him. We examine ourselves and we make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 and 17. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? And of course he's speaking of the Lord's Supper here. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. We receive the Lord's Supper as do Christians all over the world. And in doing so, we're showing that there is indeed only one church, one body of Christ symbolized by that one loaf. Many different organizations, many names over our doors, but in reality, there is only one church that's composed of all of those who have been born again. Because of that oneness, that unity, if you have something against a brother or sister, you should make every effort to clear it up, especially before taking the Lord's Supper. Now, Matthew 5, 23 and 24 is not specifically speaking about the Lord's Supper, but I believe there is a definite principle here that we need to follow. If we have something against a brother or a sister or they have something against us, we should make every effort to make things right. Matthew 5:23. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Romans 12:18 is still another important principle for getting along with others. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Or what about... Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men 
and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Now you may notice in 1 Corinthians 11 when speaking of the Lord's Supper, it speaks of receiving in an unworthy manner or receiving unworthily, not discerning the Lord's body. The Lord's body, of course, is people, those that are with you. Uh, the late A.G. pastor J. Robert Ashcroft, he was the father of former Attorney General John Ashcroft. He wrote a book about the Lord's Supper, and he relates the following story. He says, as a young minister, I stood at the altar preparing to administer communion. It was a moment of sincere worship and love for our Lord. A strong urge came over me to express to the Lord how deeply I loved him. I had remembered reading of one who had felt a similar emotion. He wrote, just when I feel to throw my arms around the Lord, I fall at his feet in devotion. I felt exactly the same way. As I expressed this love for the Lord with a sincere desire to throw my arms about him in loving worship, he said to me, I'm standing by your side. Standing right by my side, assisting me in serving communion as one of the deacons in the body of believers I was serving. As a matter of fact, he was an older man and very conservative in his thinking. He seldom agreed with my youthful aggressiveness and impromptu decisions of action for the church. So we were not on the most congenial of terms. Oh, we were professional. We were civil. We'd not had any words of conflict, but it was purely atmospheric. On my part, I felt resentful that I had to cope with his views of carefulness and caution toward actions to be taken by the church. But the Lord said to me that day, if you want to embrace me, I'm standing beside you. To embrace my brother was to embrace the Lord. All of those great truths of the teaching of Jesus flooded my mind in just a few seconds, such as, how can we love God whom we have not seen if we do not love our brother whom we have seen? Or, inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. So I turned to my brother, threw my arms about him, and loved him as though he were the Lord himself. Immediately I felt toward him as I never felt before. From that moment to the rest of his life, we were close friends. Since then, I have not forgotten the great lesson taught me by in that incident. The truth of seeing every believer as a member of the body of Christ has been a major influence in my life. It has helped to cool down pride and prejudice. It has saved me many long detours in Christian growth. It has rewarded me for patience. It has paid me rich dividends. As I grow older... I am still learning from this early experience in my ministry. And that's from Brother Ashcroft's book, The Body of Christ, A Devotional Study. Praise God, we are one body, one church, one family. And we show that when we come to the Lord's table. Also, receiving the Lord's Supper, we're commanded to examine our hearts. Just what does that mean? 1 Corinthians 11 Reminds us that we do that. Verse 28, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. I want you to notice that we examine ourselves. I don't examine you. You don't examine me. We examine ourselves. First Corinthians calls that self-examination. You know, we're, we're judging ourselves. The Bible says, if we will judge ourselves, we will not be judged. Verse 31. So we will either judge ourselves and receive God's forgiveness or we will face the judgment of God one day. How much better to judge ourselves to repent and receive his forgiveness and mercy? How much better to examine ourselves uh, than face judgment later? Examining ourselves, if we're truly honest, we'll all realize that we stand greatly, greatly in need of a Savior. All right, receiving the Lord's Supper reminds us also that Jesus is coming again. Hear the word of the Lord from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. 
I emphasize that last phrase, till he come. So as long as we're on this earth and until Jesus comes, we're commanded to continue to receive the Lord's Supper on an ongoing basis. Every time we take communion, we're to do so obediently until Jesus returns. We also find Jesus' words at the Last Supper with his disciples. Matthew 26, 29, and perhaps we've already read these words, but I want to read them again. I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until, very important word, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now think about it, church. We eat at the Lord's table here on earth looking forward to the day when we'll all be together at what Revelation calls the marriage supper of the Lamb. Communion is a preview of that. I really believe that is what it's looking forward to. We come to the Lord's table in unity, expecting that one day we will all be together in the Father's house, sitting at his table in heavenly glory. Communion is a great reminder of that coming day. So it's a look backward to the cross. It's a look forward uh, to the coming of Christ. And of course, it's a look outward to our brothers and sisters as we seek to be in right relationship with them. And when I take the Lord's Supper, I, I'm reminded without him, I'm, I'm nothing. John 6, 53, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a, you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Of course, we don't literally do that. But we do allow the Lord to be our everything, to inundate and saturate and fill our lives. If we don't do that, we have no spiritual life in us. He's our all in all. Without him, we can do nothing. After all, he is the bread of life. He's like the manna that came down from heaven. Everything that we need every day. John 6, 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Praise God. Without him, we are nothing. But when we receive the Lord's Supper, it's a good time to make a fresh commitment and what I would call renewing your vows. Now, that may not make sense at first, but this is something that I've started doing over the years. As you know, we have two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Normally, we're baptized only once. Now, I was sprinkled as an infant, an infant but that's not really baptism. Later on, as a, a teenager... Just reading the word of God, I recognized that was not baptism. And I submitted myself to uh, believer's baptism. But for the most part, we're only baptized once. However, we take the Lord's Supper on a regular, ongoing basis. Now, looking back to when I was saved and later on when I was baptized in water, it was a point of my saying, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Now, as for me, when I take the Lord's Supper now, I remember that day and I recommit my life to following him. Uh, I kind of think of it along the terms of maybe a couple that's been married for 50 years and yet they choose to renew their vows. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong. They've got a, a wonderful, happy marriage, but they, they want to say, Lord, or to their beloved, I, I still do. I renew those vows I made to you. And I do that oftentimes when I take the Lord's Supper. I encourage you to do the same thing today. Renew your vows. Now, these things really just scratch the surface of what we could learn about the Lord. That is what we can learn about the Lord's Supper. So before we begin, let's just take a moment to examine yourself. You know, I, I've shared with you before. We give you opportunity to take the Lord's Supper and we don't want it to be just a ritual. And we know it's important for the most part. We do this together with other believers, but I know it's not possible for all of you. So as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper together, uh, let's take some time to examine ourselves just as commanded in the word of God. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. 
Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, and we've talked about that earlier, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. I we're told there in that chapter that if we judge ourselves, we'll not be judged. We want to be in right relationship with the Lord and with his people. Uh, we're thankful that as we examine ourselves and, and if sin comes to mind, if the Lord convicts us, we can confess our sin and receive his cleansing. So let's just take a moment and examine ourselves. Lord, we do examine ourselves. In doing so, Lord God, we recognize how much we need a Savior. Oh, Lord, we recognize without you we could do nothing. Lord, we confess our sin, thankful that you are faithful and just to forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, prepare us to receive this cup and this bread. Today, Lord, we take this bread in our hands and we remember. We remember the word of God. I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this bread, this bread that reminds us that our Jesus lived a perfect, holy life, a life without sin. We recognize today that he is the bread of life. He is the manna from heaven. We thank you, Lord, even for healing that you've provided, that your word says you were wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon you, Lord, and by your stripes we're healed. So recognizing that you're the bread of life, Lord, we receive you anew and afresh. We renew our vows. We recommit to following you and serving you. That commitment we made to you when we were first saved, when we were first baptized in water. We do this remembering you, Lord. You're our everything. And we take this bread together, Lord, with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take the bread together with great thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we hold in our hands this cup, this reminder of the shed blood of Jesus. We remember your word after this manner also. He took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is a new testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now this cup represents the blood that he shed for us. The Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And we're given wonderful promises concerning his blood. First uh, John 1, 7 says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Literally in the Greek, it means that the blood keeps on cleansing us from all sin. He, he makes us clean, and he keeps us clean. Everything we will ever need was purchased for us through the shedding of his blood on the cross. Can we pause right now and thank him for the blood? Lord, I thank you for the blood that you shed for me. Lord, I thank you that my life, my all, has been provided for in Christ. I praise you for what you did for me in giving your life. Today I take this, this cup today remembering your sacrificial death. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's take the cup together and remember Jesus says, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink it in remembrance of him today.
Praise God forever. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful ordinance that you've given us of the Lord's Supper. Uh, this week, Lord God, I pray that you will remind us again and again of the sacrifice that was made for us as we contemplate what you did for us there so long ago. Hold us all in the hall of your hand, Lord, and keep us close to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. We'd like to hear from you if there's any way we can be of spiritual help. You can contact us by mail at the Madaryville Assembly of God, Post Office Box 160, Madaryville, Indiana, 47957. Or by email, madaryvilleag at yahoo.com. Of course, you can contact us by phone at 1-219-843-2262. Well, until we meet again, may God hold you in the hollow of his hand. And don't forget, keep looking up. Jesus is coming again. Maranatha.